Stay more comfortable, more concealed, and in the stand longer with Osseo gear. Premium camouflage apparel created for bow hunters by bow hunters. Osseo's revolutionary patented camo patterns and innovative features are designed to keep whitetail bow hunters totally invisible and dead quiet. Elevate your game with Osseo. Visit asiogear.com and take 20% off your purchase with code TRUTH20. Mobile hunters, our buddies over at Tethered are always innovating to keep us more mobile and in the game when it counts. From the Tethered One Sticks, the Fast Pack, to the Ultra Lock Saddle, Tethered is always designing to increase comfort and utility while reducing bulk, weight, and fiddle factor of mobile hunting gear. And now, they've outdone themselves yet again by creating the Carbon Fiber Forged Predator CFX Platform, the lightest fully featured mobile saddle platform that raises the bar for what's possible in mobile hunting gear. Whether you're new to saddle hunting or an old tree climbing veteran, go to tetherednation.com for all your saddle hunting gear. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I got my buddy, that sexy fellow on the other side, Mr. Jake Bush. What's going on, buddy? Clint, thanks for having me on again, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. I always look forward to chatting with you. We were actually talking before we hit record, and we were like, man, we should just record that whole thing. That was, like, perfect. <laughs> yeah, there was some good information in there. Uh, uh, but, yeah, man, I love love coming on the show. It, it normally tips me off that season's right around the corner. We seem to do this thing, you know, once a year, and That's it right. times up pretty well. So, so I'm excited. Nice, man. Yeah, I always uh, I always dig having you on. I always like to pick your brain. You always have like a little nugget for me right before the season, a little bit of inspiration. You know, I've been following, I've been watching a lot of your stories. You know, you're always in the woods, man, and I'm always fired up to watch what you're going. You're kind of my uh, my barometer a little bit. You know, it's like, I like that. yeah, whatever I start seeing, when I start seeing you find acorns <laughs> dropping, I'm like, oh, man, I need to get out and check, you know, because... <laughs> I don't get out quite as often as you do, but when you, I start seeing your post and you got like acorns that are falling, I was like, all right, I need to go check my feed trees now. Yeah. So if you notice that like they're not ripe, right? First off, they're in the trees and then some fall and they're not ripe and then they're like half ripe. Yep. And we're about in the stage where the whites are almost fully ripe. And then I'm like, all right, well, things are going to switch around here in the next week or so. And then we got a couple weeks to build a pattern up and hopefully everybody's in the woods doing that. And then it's go time. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's always the big, the big thing, right? Like, cause I've been just the driving around I've been doing, you know, there's not really bean fields anywhere close to where I hunt, but there are some local and I'll glass just for fun, just to see deer out and stuff like that local to me and stuff. But I pay attention to it cause it kind of, you know, the beans are drying up. Like I'm getting, I'm watching them yellow, at least around me. And that kind of tips me off that a lot of the stuff that we hold true that we've seen the past several months is all about the change and about to be not true any longer. Right. And it's not to be, not to get disheartened necessarily that, you know, the shifting is going to happen and the things are going to change. It just means you got to kind of make sure your plan's dialed in. You got to get back out in the woods and figure out where the food is and, and things of that nature and, and make sure that the plan you think you have is still kind of dialed, if you will. Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. You got, you know, really two options going into season. A, you're on a food source that's going to give you that that window where you can take all that summertime inventory and patterning that you have and you can capitalize on it or B you're going to have a major shift and you're going to be scrambling if you don't already have some sort of, you know, preconceived notion built up of where you think you need to go try to target that deer. So, right. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's about to kick off. But before we jump into all the deer hunting stuff, man, you, uh, you're growing your family, brother. Congratulations. You got, you got a tribe now. That's exciting, man. So how, so you're getting some sleep is, uh, you trying to figure out how you fit hunting in with all this stuff. You know, I am, and we're actually <laughs> sleeping well. Lainey is, uh, she's a saint, man. She, she eats good. She sleeps good. And, uh, really the, the bigger challenge is probably Charlie, the toddler right now, you know, he's trying to figure <laughs> out why he doesn't have all the attention he used to have and stuff, but, right. but all is well, man. It really is. Um, yeah, the balance of, of life's, you know, trying to figure that out. It's less mm-hmm. time in the woods and uh, more time with the family, which is great. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out the whole the whole work thing with about an hour drive every day. I drive far mm-hmm. so I can hunt close. Right. Kind of deal, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, all is well, man. How's everything for you? Things are good, man. It's, uh, it's funny that, you, you know, trying to find that balance of, uh, you know, hunting and family and work and all that stuff. And I've talked to some, you know, different buddies. I'd be curious you know, what your thoughts are on this, but I kind of found that, you know, even when family stuff got busy, almost like the busier it got, cause my daughter now she's, she's 16 now, you know, I got like two more years of her being in the house and I'm going to be an empty nester and then I can go hunt, do whatever I want, whenever yeah. I want within, within reason. Um, 
but it's weird because you have this period of time, you know, kind of where you're at, where it's very intense, right? Where it's like, there's, they can't do anything for themselves. So everything you have to do, right. And then you hit this period where it eases up a little bit where they don't have a, so they they don't need a ton of like your not attention, but like, you don't have to do everything for them, but they also don't quite have a social calendar yet. Right. And then you hit where I'm at, which is like, you're basically a shop. You're basically a chauffeur, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and you get real busy cause they have a social life and they need you to take, take them everywhere. Um, and what I've found is that when that stuff gets busier, I'm actually better in the woods because I know I'm on limited time and I just, and I cut away the, the BS and, and I just focus on the stuff that's meaningful and important. And, I, and when I go to the woods, like I have a plan and I work the plan as opposed to like, Hey, what's over here? You know, and just kind of like you get scatterbrained a little bit. And I found now it's like, I'm just, I'm dialed when I hit the woods and I know exactly what I got to do. I get in and do it and I get out. I mean, that's a great point, man. It's, there is a lot of, you know, excessive things that we seem to do, especially myself in the woods. And, uh, it's almost more like an out of state hunt, right? Like you Mm -hmm. have limited time, limited resources. You have to be as efficient as possible and you have to make, uh, more gut decisions as opposed to being like, well, I can hang back or I can, you know, not, not fully trust what I want to do. And I know that I have leeway with that. And, and so it can lead, especially if you're a good skilled hunter, it can definitely lead to, uh, to more success for sure. Yeah. I've found for me at least that it's, uh, um, giving myself fewer options is better for me. Cause I hunt, I actually hunt better out of state than I do in my home state usually, because I do, I know a little bit more. So I get a little bit more paralyzed because I have, have time. Right. And when I'm out of state, it's like, I see something, I execute on what I just saw and, and I don't ask questions. I just, it's like, Hey, they said it did this. It must be true. I'm going to go do this, you know? Um, so I definitely think there's something to be said, said for that, where you limit your, limit your options. Options are nice. Too many can be a problem, right? Yeah. And it's, uh, the same thing can be said about confidence in the woods mm. too. It's the same thing. Like I, if I look back, you know, five years ago, I was probably less knowledgeable than I am now. I would say that that's, that's a fair statement to make, Right. but I had a lot more success, a lot more efficiently back then because <laughs> I was, I was very, uh, very stubborn with the decisions I was making. And I was like, I fully believed in every choice that I was making and I didn't have a lot of options or a lot of, you know, listen to podcast knowledge, for example. Well, now I know 35 different tactics in the back of my head that I can implement here instead of just doing the one that I normally would have did. Mm-hmm. And so it's like trying to figure out the balance of that. You know, it's, you can definitely become paralyzed by overanalyzing your situation. I think that the confidence thing plays in the exact same way. Yeah, I 100% agree. Because it, it's odd that whenever I'm away from home, I'm way more confident. When I'm at home, less confident. Yeah. Because I have way more options or I know more about the area. Yeah, and you're just trying to figure out every move he's going to make and instead of, hey, this is the move that I just know he's going to make and I'm going to try to go after that. I got into trouble last year, uh, Kentucky hunt. Uh, the Kansas hunt, actually, yeah, Kansas hunt. I had the first big buck come by that was at 33 and I couldn't shoot. And then Indiana, I had a stud at 50 yards and I should have been set up about 15 yards away. But instead of being confident in what I knew and where I thought, where I knew they were going to be bedded, I stayed back and I got a little bit uh, greedy because I could cover more trails from further back. And then they hit the trails that I really expected them to come down. I couldn't shoot them. So, you know, I look back on that, like, what are you doing, man? Like you are out there and you have to, it's like playing football, right? You can't, you, you, if you're a quarterback, you have to take the shot and you have very limited time to make that shot, but you have to be confident in it. If you're not, it's going to be intercepted or you're going to throw it high or low or it's the exact same thing. And I had that happen three times last year in three different States and ended up coming up empty handed twice because of that. So, so yeah, that's a big focus of mine this year is just get back to the roots and, um, get back to fully believing in what I've learned as a hunter and where I'm at at this point and just, just going for it and, and not being overly greedy with the situation, just taking what I believe in instead of trying to get the whole, the whole pie. Yeah. I mean, that, that's so important, man, that especially that trying to cover everything in a setup, right? I, we're all guilty of that, right? We want it all, right? It's like, I could sit here and I could cover this and I could cover this and I could yeah. probably shoot that, right? And then the reality is, is like the deer uses the thing that you said, you know, I'm, I'm, well, I'll give this up a little bit, right? It's like, you always have to give something up, right? Um, as opposed to just being dead set on, you know, that this is where I need to be and just and wholeheartedly believing it, right? 
there's something to be said for that confidence for sure. But speaking of confidence, man, I've been watching, uh, like you, you've got the recurve out now, man. You got a little, some stick and string going on. What's going on there? I've been shooting the longbow a lot, man. I, uh, I think I'm going to break it out a little bit this year. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with it so I can, I just, I kind of got to the point where I love deer hunting. Right. But I didn't love shooting my compound all the time. Like it, uh, I felt like I was a good shot. I mean, I made some bad shots last year. Don't get me wrong, but I felt like I was a good shot and it was just very repetitive. And, and you know, you can, you could probably take it a lot further than I did and it would be more exciting, but I've just never been that person. Like I buy my arrows, I, I, you know, paper tune it. And then I sight it in and I just shoot it as much as I can, but it mm -hmm. never really went beyond that. Um, but the longbow, like shooting instinctive with that, it's a totally different game for me. It's just, it, it is like the ultimate, uh, it's like the ultimate thing for me. I just, I absolutely love going out there and firing away and it's, you know, whether I'm shooting five yards in the basement or 15 yards or out in the woods, stump shooting or, you know, whatever it is, it's just. It brings back a whole new love of archery for me, and uh, I'm excited to I'm excited to get it out in the woods a little bit. Maybe if I do a impromptu, you know, Indiana or Kentucky hunt, I'll take it with me the whole time. But we'll see. Nice, yeah. It's a uh, I it, I was in the same a similar boat. I, I, had, I took some time off shooting last year because I had a messed up shoulder, but I was kind of getting to that point where it's like I used to shoot a lot. I used to have a club that I would go shoot at pretty frequently and stuff like that, shoot some 3D, not competition, but just like there was a huge 3D course and they had a big place and it was fun to go to. And then I kind of fell off with it where I just didn't shoot as often. It was kind of the same thing where I was just, I, I won't say it was, was boring. I just didn't enjoy it as much as I used to. It's like I'd pull it out once in a while and be like, oh yeah, it was kind of fun. But then once I got introduced to a longbow, it was the same thing where it was like, I couldn't wait to shoot it, you yeah. know, and I have to make myself set it down because I'll start shooting too much. You know, it's like once you get tired or whatever and you, your form starts to go away, you should just put it down so you don't, you know, create bad habits or whatever. Um, but the same as you, it's like I have a setup in my basement because I'll just go down and rip off like shots when I walk through my little archery room, you know, just like to get feel the break, like get some good breaks, mm -hmm. you know, and it's laying back here actually on this like little stand um and i'll grab it during work you know i'll have like in between meetings like oh i got 15 minutes i'll go out and like rip off like five or ten arrows you know and come back inside for my next meeting or whatever um and it's made me a better compound shooter too like have you noticed that as well like for me it's like made me so much better and i actually enjoy shooting the compound again but i've become way better with the compound oh for sure i think everything's amplified with with the stick bow Mm -hmm. Right. Like if you have a little bit of hand torque, well, it's so light that it's going to either slap your wrist real bad or it's going to shoot an arrow way up to the left. And mm -hmm. uh, so like finding the, you know, the deadness in your hand or finding better alignment, you know, better uh, skeletal alignment, mm -hmm. it seems to have better shots. And so like I've noticed my form has gotten a lot better with the compound. And then it's also easier for, I would say I have less target panic now or it's less it's it's more difficult for me to have target target panic now than it used to be because I'm used to that clean break with the longbow now and like really focusing on that. So the release is a lot easier. Like it's you know, it's a lot easier to not punch that trigger after you doing the longbow with the finger slap for a while. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure, man. It's uh then I always look at it when I'm shooting my compound where I'm like I can't I can't make as bad of a shot as, as I've made with my, with my compound as I have with my longbow. You know what I mean? Like you're in the yard and you're shooting, and you're like, Oh man, I'm dropping them in there today. You shoot like 10 arrows and then you get one where it's like, you're shooting a 3d target and you're like just dropping them into the boiler maker. Then all of a sudden, like you get one, and you're like, well, dude, I shot him in the neck that time. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah. how did that happen? You know? And I pick up my compound and like, everything's like here, you know what I mean? You're like, okay, I feel a lot better. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it is, it is funny. Cause sometimes it's a clean break and it feels good. And you're like, wow, I'm two feet off of where I was aiming there. Like yeah, what yeah. is going on? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, I'm never that bad with the compounds. It's always, <laughs> yeah, you know, for sure. nice man. Yeah. I'm a, I think I'm going to take it for some early season. Cause my season, I'll get back from Idaho and my season will be in. Um, and I'll have like a week or so before like the statewide season comes in. So I'll probably take it out locally and see if I can't whack a doe with it in like a sit or two. So I've told myself if I draw some blood with it, it might, it might go with me for like the whitetail hunts this year. I was like, but I, I just feel, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I feel like I need to have a little bit of, I need to have a couple kills under my belt with it before I'm going to feel like I can take it on hunts where I have, you know, some goals or, or whatever the case is, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, and one of the most odd things too, especially like if if it's your first time, uh, when you draw back on a live animal with your compound, like you have a point that you're putting on that mm-hmm. animal, right? But with the longbow, especially if you're an instinctive shooter and you're not using the tip of your arrow, when you draw back on a live animal for the first time and you're looking at that animal, all thoughts of aiming go out the window, right? You're like, well, there's a whole deer that I'm looking at. <laughs> yes. Like, where is the thing pointed? You yeah. Know? And so like the, but you have to trust your instinctual process at that point and, you know, stare your, stare your spot down. But it's definitely like a flash thought that you get where you're like, I, I don't even know if I'm aiming at this damn thing right now or not. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I shoot instinctive too. I shoot three under, do you shoot three under or split finger? Or? So I do. Yeah. I do three under three under. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I just felt more comfortable with that. And that what you were saying is like the thing that I'm like, I need to, I need to get some live targets cause I need to make sure I can stare at the spot. You know, and you start to, you start to see too, it it shows a lot of holes in your game. You know, when you start shooting, at least it did for me that I was getting a little lazy with my compound even, you know, cause you know, you can get a little bit lazy unless shots still aren't terrible, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but when I picked up the longbow, like I have a natural tendency to like, let my eyes drift to the left. And like, as soon as I picked up the longbow, it's like when I first started shooting it, man, it was like, everything was going left, everything. You know, and I was shooting with a buddy of mine and he's like, everything looks good, you know? And so, and what I, what I had figured out was I just caught myself doing it. It's like, I would stare at my spot. And as I would stare at the spot, like my eyes would just start shifting to the left a little bit. And that was, and I, so I have to consciously make sure. So it's just, it's such a good tool to kind of expose any gaps or weaknesses you have in your, in your archery form. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So man, let's move into the season, dude. So Jake Bush, any targets this year? What's your, what's, what's it look like? You got some, and we don't need specifics. I don't like to get into specifics with things with, with guys. Cause I don't want to cause any, any issues, but do you have, uh, any, any that are piquing your interest currently? So I do. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, it's a good year coming mm-hmm. back off the HD two years ago. Last year was a little rough. Targets were limited. Uh, this year feels more like the year before EHD now where you know you're starting to glass up some good ones out in the bean fields again that are close to public and uh i I left a lot of soaker cams out this year and i've been pulling them recently just uh, you know hey two hours on a wednesday night and the wife and the kids are going to her parents house for a couple hours it's like all right i'm gonna shoot out and grab some cameras Mm -hmm. and uh i've had some good bucks pop up on those cameras like some really good ones so yeah there's there's a lot of targets out there man um I'm excited to track down a couple that are, are kind of top tier and we'll, we'll see where it goes. Right. So you have a couple this year. You're not, you're not focused in on, on one specific, you have a kind of a, a group, if you will, like a, you know, a small group that of, 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 of ones that you would kill if you see. Yeah. So one I have history with a couple I have history with the one I have a lot of history with. Uh, and then there's some newer ones mm-hmm. that I'm, I would be glad to shoot. So it'll just, We'll have to see what happens. You know, we might get down to the week before season and I go in and I pull a couple of cameras and say, hey, you know, I would love to chase down this one that I have a lot of history with, but this buck of the same class is on a pattern that I just can't ignore. Right. And, uh, you know, at this point, especially with the family, like, man, the the first one in that class that gives me the chance I'm going to take, I'm not going to, I'm not going to selfishly chase the deer that I would want more than the other ones all year and spend time away from the family when I'd be more than happy you know, hunting my hunt and getting a, getting a good buck on the ground. Right. Yeah. That's cool, man. Like that's a, it's such a, um, a different kind of perspective, right. Or a little bit of a shift, right. Like, cause in years past, man, it's like, I've known you to be that mani- maniacal. There is one that has the, has the hex on him <laughs> and he's going to get it, you know, and like, and I'm going to do whatever, you know, it's going to be however long it takes to get that, get that one. And, uh, you know, and it's interesting how like, you know, things change family. We have families and stuff like that. And then it becomes what you just said, which I loved, which was like, was to hunt your hunt. Right. Cause that was one thing I was talking. I forget who I was talking to. Oh, it was Cody. I was talking to Cody about it and he was, you know, talking about, you know, in setups and stuff like that, how important it is for him to not necessarily yet. Yeah, yes. Be in the right spot, but how important, how it's more important for him to be able to hunt his hunt from the setup. Like, there might be another setup that might be slightly better quote unquote, but it won't let him hunt his hunt. And so he'll choose the one that'll let him hunt his hunt over the spot that might be quote unquote, a little bit better of a setup for him. So I love hearing you say, you know, it lets you hunt your hunt. Cause I think that's important that we all kind of think, 
think of that as we kind of go into things and don't let things kind of get away from us. Yeah, man. that That's like the hills for me, right? Like I could, <laughs> I live right near some really good ag and I'm sure I could go scout it and chase down some bucks out there and there's probably good ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but my hunt in Ohio at least is in the hills. Like it's, <clears> it's my love. And so that's where I'll end up going, whether it, you know, somebody will probably kill me, but, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, man. And you know, I had a, I had a big wake up call the other day and I've been, you know, becoming a dad was obviously a huge change on, uh, how I view, you know, the world and hunting and chasing big deer and, and everything. And, um, you know, becoming a dad for the second time with Laney has just even has amplified that. And so I've been trying to really reinvent, you know, my love for it and, and what I need out of hunting and what I need out of the, uh, you know, being in the outdoors. And, uh, I'm still trying to find that, to be honest with you. I, you know, coming off last year, I feel like I was very immersed in social media and, and a lot of things. And, I, uh, I didn't love all that. Right. And so I took a hiatus, like a little, you know, sabbatical for eight months or so off social media and, and it was great. And, and then all my time I spent out in the woods with, you know, like I had Charlie on the back and we were shed hunting out in the Hills and he, you know, he didn't, he loved it for a while, but then he didn't love it and we left. Right. But, uh, <laughs> It'll let you know he doesn't love it too. <laughs> yeah. But like things like that, there was a lot of like, you know, beautiful moments that I didn't have to share with anybody. And I, I honestly really enjoyed that. Um, and, and so I'm trying to just figure that out. And so the other day I'm, I'm outside and shoot my bow, getting, you know, my bow tuned up and, um, Charlie man is, he's really hyper, right? Like that's, we're working on him being hyper and, um, trying to like, you know, instill some calmness in him and, but he's right. three, he's a boy. Yeah, he's right, a, yeah. we call him Donnie from the wild thornberries. He's, he's crazy. <laughs> but, um, so, so he really never slows down from the time he wakes up to the time he goes to bed and. The other day we had that cold front roll through, right? And it's like, I don't know, a high in the mid sixties, which is a 20, 25 degree temp drop. And you can feel the the fall breeze, right? And every year, like I always remember the first time I feel that, right? I remember mm-hmm. feeling that as a kid. And uh, Charlie was, he has this little green bike that he rides and he's down in the yard and I'm, I'm watching him and normally he's real hyper and all of a sudden he gets calm. And it was like a indicator for me because he never does that. And that stiff, cool breeze hit him in the face and he just completely paused. <laughs> and he sat down there on his bike and just looked at the leaves fall off the trees and it was just in total peace for like 15 minutes in his mm-hmm. own little world down there. And I just like, I mean, I teared up a little bit and I was like, I remember that feeling as a kid and, and that's why I truly do what I do in the woods. Like that's why I'm out there is because I was that little boy in that same position, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago where I felt that cool breeze for the first time. And then I've always just like, I've always longed for fall and for that feeling. Yes. And man, it was, it, it was a big wake up call for me. I went in the woods that night and scouted a little bit and I, I just took everything in, in a totally different state, like yeah. every tree and every acorn and every track. And I felt like a little kid again. And so, man, I, I want to feel that more often, right? I want to, whatever I need to do hunting wise to feel that that's what I want to do, whether it's more family time or uh, less concern with big deer, whatever the case may be like that. My goal is to feel that. And my goal is for everybody else to be able to feel that. Yeah, dude, that's so awesome. Like I saw someone had mentioned something the other day and it, and it kind of struck me because I didn't realize that I, I, I try to do this every, every time that I'm out and I was out scouting this past weekend and stuff like that. And it was, it was checking like some setups and, 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 uh, spent a little time in like one location and, um, and it was cold this, this past weekend. I think it was like 48 in the morning, you know? And so I think it was like, you know, low sixties, like in the afternoon or whatever. And I was mainly out just like in the morning. And so it was nice and brisk. So it was that kind of like what you're talking about where it's like, it's, it's here, you know, and I'm sitting in the woods and I'm in a spot and I just kind of sat, you know, for a minute and was doing some stuff. And I just kind of sat back and like, and just looked around you know, and was just taking in like how the sun was cresting over the trees and like just all the little things that you take for granted. And, and it's like, I mean, I hope everyone does that anytime they're out. So they at least take like a, like a brief moment, right. And just sit and kind of be, and be still and just take in what is going on around you because there's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's food for the soul, man. And I love, I love hearing you say that, man. Cause I, I try to remind myself to do that um, as often as I can. And I feel the same way you do, right. Where it's, you know, 
it's uh I think you do hit a certain point where you start to question like what do things actually mean to you right um sometimes being a dad makes that change for you you know for sure yeah. um you know because you don't think about just yourself anymore and and things like that um and then you start to also question like how much do these things mean to me you know and 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 in you know and what and what how are they enriching my life right and how can i get more of that right because that's what it becomes about it becomes about filling the cup you know and less about look at me necessarily right and i think a lot of times you know and it's it's natural man we all like want those moments we want to achieve things you know what mm-hmm. i mean and there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with that but if we blindly chase those things and we don't take the moments to 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 refill our cups and fill others at the same time right then we're then we're really missing out because that's where the magic is for sure yeah it really is dude i i couldn't have said that better myself i mean i just I know for me personally, like I did chase a little bit of the things I shouldn't have chased. Right. We all and, have. Yeah. And, but, but coming back down from that on the other side, like I'm, I'm much happier where I'm at now mm-hmm. and I'm much more excited to go into this season with just, just truly find it, trying to find like love out in the outdoors. Right. Like right. that's what I want to do is I want to just immerse myself in the outdoors and be as present as possible. And uncouple myself from you know modern taste society when i'm out there and you know the corporate grind and all that and like i don't know i just want to get back to where it's it's the the true escape again and where it's where i find my peace and and so that's my big focus nice yeah i love that man because that's to me the last couple years has been you know um like i've been kind of chasing that like i and i've chased it in a lot of different ways i chased it in you know i chased it in music for a long time in my life you know trying to put my finger on the thing that, you know, cause I think sometimes when we're out hunting and we're doing these things that we love, we're also trying to look, get some answers about ourselves to a degree, right? We're trying to find that, that peace and that enjoyment and, and fill our cup, so to speak. Right. But we're also trying to like, what is, what am I like? What makes yeah. me tick? Right. I think we're kind of always looking for that. And, you know, and I had, for me, I had like a, you know, I don't know to call it a, an epiphany or whatever it is. Um, you know, cause I was like, I always chase things that are hard, like in, in being hard, isn't necessarily the thing that entices me about it. Right. But what I kind of figured out was like, whether it was music or whether it was jujitsu or whether it was hunting was that I was always interested in chasing things that had no, no hope of mastery. And the same thing with like a longbow, right? Because I just love the process and I'm a lifelong learner. Like that's, that's what it is. Right. Um, and so it was deeper than it just being hard. It's like, no, it's like, I have this desire to evolve constantly right um in the outdoors and there's no it's not a big surprise as to why i'm drawn to it's because it's the ultimate place to evolve right it's nothing but evolution you know what i mean like all around you like there's nothing that's in your control right and there's something weird weirdly peaceful for me at least about not being in control of anything you know is that i'm just i'm just part of the variables that are here just like everything else you know and you get to feel small and you get to not necessarily be the centerpiece. Right. And then I think if you really think about it, it's like the critter that you're chasing ultimately is the centerpiece. Then that's the thing you're ultimately trying to honor. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, dude. Yeah. So speaking of honoring the beast, dude, we're going to get back to the, back to chasing, chasing a buck here real quick. Um, all right. So target buck, right. Or you have a couple that you're, that you're looking to kind of make some moves on. So let's, let's talk about the one that you have some history with, like what type of history have you had with that deer and like, what, like, how do you keep track of him? Like as you go from season to season, so to speak, right? Because you're one of the dudes and we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording that, you know, what I've, what I've often admired about how you approach things is like your ability and willingness to follow a deer, not just a deer that maybe you had history with last year and that you maybe had on camera, maybe had an encounter Maybe you had a close encounter where you just didn't get a shot off or whatever the case is, but your ability to follow him from hunting season and then stay on him in the summer and you stay on in like September and you kind of know everything that deer is doing like all times of the year, right? Where I think, and I think it's so, it's, it's impressive one for me because I just have never had the aptitude. I'm just recently kind of doing that. Um, 
But talk a little bit about how you kind of follow them and what you're looking for to kind of stay on them, especially this time of year. Because a lot of people just say, I got some summer pictures and, you know, and that's about as far as they go. You're going out, you're finding tracks and like knowing, like, okay, this is the deer that I'm looking for. This is what he's doing now. This is where he's spending time now, which ultimately helps you kind of have a 360 view of like what that dude's world is when you, when, when it's time to actually try to, try to hunt him. Yeah. You know, I've never heard anybody frame it <clears throat> like, uh. I guess I've never like taken a step back from a 10,000 foot view and looked at how I am chasing those deer all year in some way, shape or form. Right. Um, I think a little bit of it is it's, uh, it's like chasing the mystery of that deer. Like, you know, I might lose him for a week here or a week there and I want to figure that out. Right. So in season, I build up all these patterns on the deer through cameras, visual observations, uh, finding tracks. And then after season, I like to go back and look at those gaps. Like, you know, okay, here's the data I had. Like, to me, acquiring that data is the easy part. Like, you get your trail cameras, you, you know, whether you have a spreadsheet or or what it may be, like, you have data. But what about what you don't have, right? Like, you're going to have more gaps in data than you have data. And so, well, okay, how can I fill in these gaps? And so that's where I start. Um, going into the winter and, and scouting for that buck again. Like if it's a buck, hey, I'm going to chase him the following year. What I'm looking at is I want to go into next year with less gaps than I had this year. So whether that's finding, um, you know, some of his sign, like, you know, if he has a characteristic that sticks out like a, like a track or he has, you know, burrs on his antlers where when he makes rubs, they look more shredded. Um, you know, he has a characteristic with like he, he likes these scrapes at this elevation or he beds leeward, or he beds windward, or he does both, um, you know, prefers clear cuts. Trying to just find all those gaps and then try to just analyze them throughout the year. Uh, I love finding their sheds if I can, and there's a couple reasons for that. A, it's awesome to get the antlers off the deer you're chasing, mm-hmm. and knowing that he's going to be, you know, probably bigger next year. Um, but also that teaches me a lot about the deer, and I'll give you an example of that. So. Uh, this past year chasing the buck that I was after, I, I passed on a beautiful 10 point. Like, I don't know. He, I think he ended up being 154. We found his sheds. Um, that's assuming an 18 inch spread, but I passed up on that deer because I, I was after, you know, just an awesome buck. And, um, we go in shed hunting, my brother and I, and have a pretty good idea where those deer were bedded. We get, you know, 150 yards off the road, bam, that 10 point sheds laying in his bed. I mean, the same bed that we've known about for uh, a couple years now, laying right in at Tines Up. So my brother's hooting and hollering down below. I found a giant, and I get down there, and um, we grab that shed. Well, we ended up shed hunting. Like, when we shed hunt in the hills, we typically will stick to some sort of elevation, and then we'll run all the ridges at that same elevation. And then if we find sign, we'll, you know, we'll pay more attention. But for the most part, we're just trying to find, like, hey, where, where were the deer bedding and feeding while they were dropping their antlers? It's easier to do that, you know, on a specific elevation, just running fast. So we ended up finding that buck's antler, you know, the first one we found at seven in the morning, the second one we found right before dark, it was a mile and a half as the crow flies away in a totally different bed on a, on a windward ridge. <laughs> and so, okay, so I have this deer that I've known about that I passed up on this one specific ridge, right? That this year is a target, by the way but he had a lot of gaps in the data that I had on him. Like he would disappear for weeks at a time. Well, now we found a shed a mile and a half away on some oaks and it's like light bulbs start to go off, right? I'm like, okay, well, now that I found his antler over here, I'm going to stage up some cameras and I'm going to see if I get that deer over here. And guess what? He's, he's already on cameras this year over there. So, you know, a lot of times we think, and, and this can be the case, but like anything with deer hunting, there's no, uh, there's no guarantees, right? A lot of times we think, oh, if you find their sheds, they're not going to be there in the summertime. <laughs> well, they can be. You know, mm-hmm. if the food's right and the bedding's right and the pressure's right, they can be anywhere they want to be. So in this situation, we have him at two different points a mile and a half away, and we're building two different patterns on this deer now. So say I don't kill him this year. Say I kill a, another one or I just don't get my shot on this one. Now I'm going to have two pools of data from this deer, right? So now I have less gaps. So going into this following year, my goal is to find those missing gaps between those two points of data, (laughs) right? So that's kind of, and sometimes I'm really strict with it. Like if it's a a very special deer, I'll get really strict with my data acquisition. But if it's, you know, just a solid buck, maybe I don't get as strict and maybe it's all in my head and I'm just keeping mental notes the best I can. (laughs) Um, 
but so so going into scouting i'm i'm trying to do that same thing right like okay so found one shed here found the other shed here i'd have data over here let's look at the acorns in this area and how it correlated to where he was at last year based on the acorns let's look at bedding in this area let's look at uh areas where he can go if there's pressure over here what if he gets bumped off this ridge the opposite direction of where his shed was his first shed was well then maybe i need to go further in that loop that direction so i start just trying to like compile all those points the best i can and then going into summertime you know if i can glass that buck up i'm going to glass that buck up um, whether it's like sitting on a, a windward ridge and, and glassing a leeward clear cut or vice versa or um, beans down below, you know, some of these areas have power lines, glassing power lines. But what it is, I, I guess, you know, trying to gather this whole, uh, it, it's more than just the pattern of the buck for me. It's truly about like, who is that buck? Like what, who and what is that, is that specific animal? What specific tendencies does he have? And it, it's also interesting to me just to see how, like, how does he live? And, and why does he live the way that he does, right? Like, why does, you know, my buddy, uh, Jacob Skliner will tell me like, man, I don't understand, like, you know how the deer will navigate through the hills, like down to the specific trail that they hop over the ridges on. And the reason I do that is because it's just very interesting to me to see how they, like, how are they inhabiting that piece of land, <laughs> you know? And so when you get that granular with it and you just, you're not just looking at the pattern to kill him on, but you're looking at like his life pattern. I think you just learn a lot about the deer. And then you can, the, the different seasons, you can cross-reference a lot of that information. Whether it's the same ridge or a different ridge or, you know, same field or a different field, same swamp, different swamp. I think you'll see a lot of the same tendencies. And then that'll help you build it together into that, you know, that final picture. Right. I was just going to say, and you took the word right out of my mouth, was tendency, right? Because my next question was going to be, <clears throat> if you see a deer, you know, a buck doing one thing, you know, I'm assuming, you know, and you kind of answered it for me that you can take that same tendency. And if you find him in another area with the same kind of, uh, terrain, habitat, whatever that he's spending time in his patterns or his tendencies are probably going to be the same as the place you found him over here where the things are all, are very similar, right? Like where if it's a swamp and you find him in another swamp, he's probably doing the same stuff in both swamps, generally speaking. Yeah, I mean, if the variables are the same, like say you have the same cover or the same edge, um, similar food sources, because the one nice thing about hunting the hills, at least where I'm at and where I've hunted, is you can almost stick to like elevations with acorns a lot of times. So like <laughs> good chestnut oak ear, right? Well, a lot of times they're right on the spines of the ridges. Uh, good red oak ear, you know, some of my buddies will talk back and forth, like we'll have a text thread going, hey, what elevation are you find in the reds on this year? I'm finding them at, you know, 600 feet. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go check 600 feet and bam. But at, hey, man, at 900, I didn't have any reds this year. So, like, you know, tendencies like that with that deer are definitely going to show. Um, and then you can take, like, that, you know, all the tendencies you build on him. And some of those will cross-reference to the other deer that will inhabit that land years from now. And so, like, I can, you know, I can think of bucks I've chased in the same area that I learned tendencies about. And a lot of the big deer are doing... Um, some things the same, not all things. So it can definitely, you know, it can send you down a rabbit hole. You don't want to go down. <laughs> I think validating that tendency is super important. I wouldn't rely on a tendency with a different deer, like from year to year without validating it. Like I wouldn't go in blind and be like, all right, I'm going to hunt this scrape because there was a big buck that hit the scrape four years ago. That was a totally different deer. Right. But if you go in there and the scrapes wide open and there's a big rub and the big track, I'm like, well, wow you know, here he is. So right. I think validation of those tendencies is very important. Um, but yeah, it, it is a lot of fun. If, if, if you haven't done it, I, I recommend just trying to keep tabs on a deer throughout the year and it'll test you in, in totally different ways. You know, like it's, uh, like we're, we're very bed to food driven or rut driven during season, but to see how they just kind of survive and inhabit the land is, is really awesome. Yeah. What, man, you're hitting on so much stuff that you know, I, I talked to Tony at Peterson about, cause we, we, he and I will text back and forth or we'll talk on the phone or on a podcast or whatever. And we talk so much about, because we will always talk about things that we know about a deer, right? You know, uh, he's bedded here, you know, and, and maybe you have proof of maybe you, to your point, you validated it, or maybe you haven't validated it. Maybe it's just an assumption or a hunch based on other things that you know about the deer, um, you know, or he's feeding here, right? 
but when we get right down to it, you know, we always get, we, he and I always land back at, there is so much about what they do that we have no effing idea. You know, <laughs> we're just yeah. completely coloring in the gaps and making stuff up. <laughs> you know what I mean? That couldn't be further from the truth in some cases, you know what I mean? And what I like about how you kind of go about things is that that's kind of your whole mission is like, is filling in those, those pieces where we all make a, where most people are making assumptions. You're actively trying to figure out how they live, not just how are you going to hunt it? Cause I think that's the big difference, right? Is that you're figuring out not how to hunt that deer. That's a byproduct of you knowing how to, how he lives. That's exactly it. I, and I think that's, I've, I've like it once again, I've never heard anybody frame it like that, but if you can figure out how the deer lives and especially the more time you can do that, of course, you're going to have more success on a deer like that when you hunt them, right? It's a byproduct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think, I think a lot of people just try to figure out how to hunt the deer, you know? And I think that that's like probably only like 25% of it trying to figure well, out how he lives is like, it's, it's, it's knowing him. It's almost not to sound weird, but it's serial killer. Like, right. Like a serial killer, like, yeah. like the good ones, like they know their prey and they watch them and they know they have a mode about them. You know what I mean? It's like in, the, in their, in their, in their kills are always the same. Right. And this is kind of the same thing. It's because they go after the same type of person because that those people typically live the same way. You know what I mean? Like, and so they, you know, whether they're, this is terrible. This we've gone down, we've gone to a dark place here. Serial killer <laughs> like, now, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> You know, whether it's the, you know, the Green River guy who was going after prostitutes, like there was a certain way they lived and that was like, you know, so he knew how they lived. So it was an easy target for him. It's, it, it, we've, we've gone off down a rabbit hole here. We went to like strippers to like <laughs> to killing deer and we're going off the rails, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, once you kind of understand how it lives, it becomes really easy to figure out how you're going to, I won't say easy, but it becomes really obvious how to kill, kill a deer at that point. As opposed yeah. to just trying to figure out how you're going to hunt him. Cause how you could hunt him could, you could hunt him a hundred different ways. Right. But how he lives is very specific. Yeah. I mean, think about it like this, right? Like, like the first time you picked up your stick bow, you, what was your goal is to hit the tar, the bullseye, right? I want to hit the yeah. bullseye. My goal was not to put it in the neighbor's yard, but sure. Yeah. It was to hit the target. <laughs> <laughs> right. So say your goal is to hit the bullseye. Well, okay. I'm focused on this goal of hitting the bullseye but I'm never going to hit it if I don't have a process built up to hit that bullseye, mm -hmm. right? If I'm just firing arrows, like, like a lot of people are firing hunts out there left and right. If I'm just firing arrows haphazardly, you know, yeah, I might hit every couple of years, but I'm probably not going to be overly consistent. But if I can build a process up to where I, I, you know, I have a smooth release and I have a good draw and I, I have good focus and not, and no torque in my hand, just like with the buck, you know, I know all those gaps for that deer. Well, then when you go to get your end goal, you're probably going to be a lot, a lot more efficient at that end goal. You're probably yeah. going to hit that mark a lot more often. Yeah. hundred percent. I'm curious when you said, you know, strict data acquisition versus like loose data acquisition, you know, how, and I've never asked you this in all the years I've known you, you know, and we've talked on podcast or text or whatever. I've never, I've never asked you this question, but I'm curious how you like, what is your method for aggregating all your information? If like when you are on a deer that you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm really strict about, I'm trying to learn everything about this guy's life. How are you acquiring, not acquiring, cause you've kind of walked through that, but how are you, uh, aggregating all that information into something that makes sense that you can actually use? Yeah. So, um, throughout like with, with trail cameras, I'll take and upload all those photos to my computer and then I'll store them in specific files. Um, I'll pull out wind directions, pull out weather patterns, pull out, you know, time of year, what food sources we had that year. And I'm a spreadsheet guy. So I'm inputting a lot of that stuff into a spreadsheet. Um, I used to be a lot more crazy with that than I am now. Now I've, I've kind of turned into like more of a, more of the loose data, if you will, more like <laughs> the not so strict data. Um, but I used to get really strict with the specific winds and the weather and, and, like, hey, this year's a good white oak year, right? Like, this was all based on a white oak pattern. So if he's still alive in three years, we have good whites again. I, I might have a good pattern build up, and I can go back, and I have reference to every photo that I need to look at and can see directions that he's traveling from and what's going on. Um, but, yeah, I would say that overall that's definitely scaled scaled back. Uh, a lot of that was was truly just trying to trust my gut more, too. You know, like, I, I went from almost like a robotic mode hunter and yeah there's there was success there for sure being like that robotic like super you know analyzing data all the time and like 
Bibu Bibu. <laughs> Bibu Bibu. <laughs> yeah. We got some we've got some gems in this episode, dude. Like we're <laughs> strippers or like serial killers, Bibu Bibu, you know. It's yeah. like... <laughs> but um but I've definitely went more into trusting the gut and then I think over time, um I've I've recognized like what patterns or what things are important to to remember about a deer, to keep, you know, on file about a deer. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, a new broom sweeps the best, right? Mm-hmm. And as you start to wear out that broom a little bit, like it doesn't sweep as good as it used to. And that it's kind of the same thing where I used to just clean up all that data. And now I'm like, you know what? A lot of this doesn't matter, but these are the things that are important. I can remember that in my brain. Um, if it is important, I'll get back into the spreadsheet game. If I think there's, if, if I think that it requires that, but it doesn't require that as much as it used to. Right. What are those key things that you, th- that you have kept like in, you know, from all the stuff that you strip away that you're like, this is data for data's sake versus data that's actually meaningful, right? And what is that meaningful stuff that you've kind of like, that you make sure to kind of keep or remember, or if you were making a spreadsheet, that that would be the thing that would go in it now? Uh, I would say preferred food sources is a big one. Like the same area, some deer, if you have a bean field in the corn field, some bucks might prefer the beans, some bucks might prefer the corn. Um, some bucks might be all over whites when they start dropping. And then like the buck I've been after, you can have whites dropping like crazy. He really doesn't push. He doesn't shift his life around to chase the white oaks, Hmm. which is something that I've killed some deer on in the past. where like, Hey, they're in this hub, right? While these whites are drying up, we got a new, uh, couple trees up here that are, that are starting to drop white oak acorns. And I go up there and then like, bam, the sign lights up and I kill that deer over it. Hmm. Where, so, so some deer will, will shift their whole life around, you know, based on that food. Some won't. So like, okay, what are the preferred food sources? Um, what are the preferred secondary food sources? Like, is he a big browse deer? Does he like, you know, clear cuts? Does he, there's, there's a bunch of possibilities there. Um, I think the shift dates are very important to me. That's probably probably one of the most important things for me is based on the food when does this deer typically shift back because like for example right now if i go well it's it's september 9th today we're recording this but if i uh if i go and pull all my cameras right now I'll, probably half the deer that i'm after aren't shifted back where i'm even going to target them in two and a half weeks three weeks <laughs> they're just not there yet so if i but some are. So some of them, based on shift dates in the past, I could probably go in and start pulling cameras. And I'll do that. Like I'll, you know, I'll start going out when I have a couple hours here and there and pulling a cam off a creek bed or whatever it may be. Um, but the ones that I know I have to wait for are based off that historical data of that deer shifting late. And sometimes it's right down to uh like dad's buck, for example. You can't see him, he's right over here, but dad's buck shifted like a week before I killed him. If I would have went in there any earlier than I did, I would have never killed that deer. So those are, I would say those are probably the two biggest ones. Um, you know, rut areas is another big one that I've started to focus on just because if I don't kill them early, which, you know, I've, I've had a streak down here in Ohio where I'm not killing them early. I end up chasing them around in the rut. I, I like to have an idea where they're going to end up. I think historical data for the rut, um, if you have very, if you have somewhat similar food sources, is pretty good right? Like it can be historical data can be good and bad, which we've talked about before. You can go down a rabbit hole and food sources are different or pressure is different or whatever it may be. The deer doesn't show up. But if you can recognize that pattern and then you can validate it, like we talked about earlier with, with any sort of historical data, well, then you're probably in the game again. And now you have a heads up on what's happening. Or you can check like a loop based on the historical data and see if it fires up or not. So I would say that shift dates, um, preferred food sources, and uh, the rut time frames are the biggest ones. Another one is like travel tendencies. Um, so some deer that I've killed will bed and they'll drop down low and then they'll navigate. Like this is specifically in the hills now. Um, they'll bed high, drop low at night, you know, whether they hit a scrape or they're feeding down low to get water, whatever it may be. And then they'll run out the drainage. Some of them will go low, but then they'll go right back up high. Um, some of them will stay high. The deer that I've been chasing, it's, it's a total, and I think this is, this is A, why he's so old and I can't kill, I haven't been able to kill him, <laughs> um, is because he isn't dropping low like a lot of deer do when I kill him, because that's a very killable tactic. 
-hmm. Like if they're bedded high, you can walk up a creek, wind in your face, and they're dropping down low. Man, if that buck's in that system that night and you uh, have a good thermal pull down and your wind's not swirling too much because you're, you know, you have the the wind blowing the direction of the drainage, you're probably going to have a pretty good shot at that deer. <clears throat> so if he did that, like if, if that was his tendency, I think he'd already be on the ground. But this deer's tendency is to bed, you know, still mainly the upper third, but sometimes down to the half. And then he goes up at night. Well, that hmm. totally changes the game. I mean, that's, well, if yeah. you're, that's a tough hunt to pull off. You know, because he's got his thermals pulling down at night. If you're above him, if you access from below during the day, he can smell you pretty good because you know you have to get high. It's not like you can stay low with the wind in your face all night. You have to get around that deer somehow. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been my kryptonite with this deer is the fact that he is uh, he's going up high after he beds. So those are tendencies I built though, right? So when he pops in a different place now. Well, okay, I'm not even looking down low in the hub very often. I have an assumption he's going to be up high, and then I can look for sign up high and try to figure that out. And I, I was all over him last year. I just, I mean, I missed him. I shot over his back. I, I blew it. I, you know, I had a lot of opportunities, but, um, but that's been the hardest challenge for me with that deer specifically. That's why I'm like, man, I wish you just drop low, or I wish another <laughs> big one would show up that would drop low. Right. Tonight. Right. <laughs> So how much, so those, I think those are all kind of interesting like factors. Cause I was waiting for you to say one thing and you didn't. And I was curious why and one was, cause a lot of people pay attention to wind mm -hmm. as far as like one of their key kind of predictors, if you will. Right. And you didn't mention that one. And, uh, as far as like your most vital data. And so is there, is, why is that? Is it just, you find that they, they don't have like a wind that they necessarily prefer consistently enough to put it into like the Rolodex of things that you're going to like bank on, or is it just the wind swirls so much in the Hills, you know, and it's more, you know, about what the thermals are doing versus what the like prevailing wind is doing. That's like key, you know, just curious why that wasn't part of it. So I would, this, this deer I've chased for three years has, uh, has had a big impact on that answer. And I used to, I, I used to be like leeward betting, right? Like if it's mm -hmm. a west wind, he's on the east slope. If it's the south, he's on the north slope. And I've just proven that wrong so many times over the last couple of years with a lot of different deer, but specifically this deer, man, he will bed on any point of any ridge, pretty much no concern about the wind at all. <laughs> and that's why it's, it's hard to kill him because I can't pinpoint him a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Like he'll bed on, I mean, I was chasing him two years ago and running some cell cams and i'm hunting him on a leeward ridge i know he's going down to this ag field and he pops up on a cell cam waking up out of his bed on a windward ridge and i'm like what are you what are you doing like, i know the bed over there i'm like what are you doing over there well he beat me right so mm -hmm. like so there's something to that and then the more i pay attention to it the more it is uh there's definitely wind-based patterns right i think mm -hmm. that that's there's so many factors that make that deer be there though like you have to have in my opinion in the hills you have to have either really good cover or really good food or like a, a really good lack of pressure and then the wind is going to play a pretty vital role like if you can say hey you know there's this food source that's why i think uh i think i would even say that food is probably more important than the wind direction for the mm -hmm. pattern a lot of times because mm -hmm. If, if you have this food source that's hot on the point of this ridge and he's coming to it, he's going to bed in proximity to that based on wind, yes, but the reason he's really there is for that food source. He'll, and deal, with, that, he'll deal with the wind and find the bedding that works for the wind, if, 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 all things being I, equal. I think, right? so, yeah. I think yeah, that's, that's, so that's like my new thought process a lot is, you know, and it might not even be the specific bed. It might he might have a dozen beds on that point that he can pick from to try to make the best situation out of the wind that he's got. Mm -hmm. Do and you that, see? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and then I was gonna say so like, and then the, if the white oaks switch two ridges over, well, he's on those white oaks over there now, regardless of what the wind's doing in that first hub that he was in, right? So like the wind over there doesn't mean if you were patterning that deer off the wind and you were just like, oh, on a west he's here, he's two ridges over because of the acorns. You know, so like, and it, it's almost not, it's almost like none of these by themselves are really the pattern. It's being able to take like, you know, two or three or four of those specific factors and stack them. And then you have that pattern to go off. Like mm -hmm. the wind means nothing without the food. The food may not mean much without the wind. 
of you, like, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it totally does. Like I'm, I'm curious if like, cause as you're kind of talking through this, it's like my brain is, I'm jotting notes here for people who are watching the video. It's like, I'm like jotting things down. Like, Oh man, I should ask for this. Like, this is making <laughs> me think of this now. Um, how old's, how old's this deer? Like, uh, like off the top of your head. I know we, when we age deer, it's like, we always have the best kind of guess to a degree based on how much history we have with the deer and stuff like that. But just in, in your mind, like what, how old's this deer? So I know of him, I know that he's at least seven and a half. I've, I've heard nine and a half from some locals, but I, he's at least seven and a half, right. which probably seems more realistic to me. Right. So I'm curious if, you know, cause you've chased a lot of singular, singular deer and you've killed a lot of singular deer that you've chased. And I'm curious if you start to notice, um, like there, I don't want to say lack of concern but we'll just say that for lack of, for lack of having a better way to say it. Do you see any kind of correlation between a deer getting older and then beginning to have less of a concern for a preference of wind to travel and or bed? I love this question because it goes against <laughs> the grain entirely. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> and I absolutely, yeah. I, the, I've told people this for a long time. Like if you can get on, um, you know, for me anyways, if you can get on a big old buck that's been doing something without really being uh, intruded on too much for five, six, seven years, it seems like they definitely have a lack of concern. Mm -hmm. Like he, like dad's buck, for example, he worked down a hub with the wind at his, from his back to his face at what, six o'clock in the afternoon, second day of season and right to a food source, oak, you know, oak flat, right to a food source and never once even thought about checking the wind or anything, never J hooked into that food source. He had done that so many times in his life and got away with it that he just, he was, you know, he didn't have any concern for that. Uh, so I've seen that a lot. I've seen it with bucks getting up to like, go get, go get water on a hot day. Right. Well, they'll go, they'll go get water two, three, four times you show up, they're just going to get water. He's already done that same thing a couple of times. He hasn't noticed, you know, a sound or anything else. So it, you know, I just keep seeing those patterns happen. Um, now is it every deer? No, like, like right. this deer. Some, some other deer are a little more spooky or whatever the case is. But I think like that ingrained behavior though, over time, I think, you know, you tell me if you feel differently, but like, I even think like, say a spooky deer at four years old, if he makes it to seven and he's and he's done the same thing over and over again, I think it almost kind of removes the spookiness from them. Just like the the consistency of not having being bothered doing whatever activity that they're doing. Yeah. I think you can, you can go really far down this rabbit hole too. You can look at human intrusion, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, some of the best spots that I have have hiker trails where the, they, I mean, I'm talking hikers within 40 yards of one of these bedded bucks up above them. And those hikers will walk by all day long. Like I can hear them when I hunt a lot of times. And I could still kill a buck off that bed because mm -hmm. he's always done that. Right. And so like you can use that to your advantage a lot. I mean, especially if you are accessing on hiker trails. Um, but you know, another thing too, is this deer is a, a good example of that. So I've killed some good deer in this area. Right. And a lot of the good deer for a long time, when I, when I first started hunting it, were just dropping down low. Well, guess who's always in the bottom of these hubs hunting? I am right. <laughs> So all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden I, it's three year olds down in the hub, right? And I can't figure right. it out. I'm like, you know, what's going on here? And then I go up top and there's a big giant buck crossing the top of a saddle that nobody's hunting because everybody's hunting the hubs. Mm -hmm. And so these deer are growing up around us, right? And we have our tendencies and then they're figuring out how can I survive Jake's hunting tendencies while I'm going to go high. And so then what it takes from us is it takes us to evolve. Our evolution will kill that deer. And so we have to recognize, hey, you know, there's, they're surviving my tendencies in this area. I've officially hunted this spot long enough that the mature deer were, were fawns when I started hunting <laughs> right. this, this spot and they're growing up surviving me, you know, as a two year old, he came down and he smelled me in the tree. Right. Like, mm -hmm. and then yeah. he, he was like, all right, well, I'm not going to do that again. But so, so now what it takes is I have to do something completely opposite of my strategy in the same area to kill an old mature buck. Mm -hmm.
And so it's just kind of funny how that evolves, you know, like that's why uh, I used to be very like, I like, hey, they, they bed this way and they travel like this and they do this. But I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of the opposite of that in a lot of these spots. And that's why I've brought in my my uh, my approach. and I'm not as like stuck in my ways now because they're they're doing different things. And I think that that's the case everywhere. I think if you get if you get overly stuck in a certain tactic or a certain uh tendency that you think is going to happen with every deer you're just you're gonna stop having the success that you should probably be having and so it just takes that evolution to come back around recognize it and then and then evolve your strategy and hopefully you're back in the game again right that's so interesting that you recognize that <laughs> these deer used to always come to the bottom and what's in the bottom i am yeah. you know what i mean it's like it's it's hilarious the serial killers in the bottom you know what i mean it's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah lock your doors at night right yeah, like, yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. exactly oh my gosh that's awesome that's hilarious so all right so dude that was an awesome rabbit hole that we jumped down so i want to move now to like the early season right because we were talking about how you build that data and you follow this deer and you learn his life and then we just kind of went down like how they're shifting and stuff like that and so you know, you know, as you mentioned, this is September 9th. Now that we're, that we're chatting, this will come out actually right around the time everyone's season will kick off, you know, toward the middle of the month, end of the end of the month when folks are get really kind of getting ready to hit the timber across the country. Um, so when you get ready to kind of start, you know, early season, like what is your, your early season approach? Generally, generally speaking, you know, it's maybe we just take this deer as an example, or maybe what you're thinking of for this, you know, for your season this year, like what your, you know, what your, your plan is. Yeah. So, I mean, if we go all the way back to some of our first podcasts that we did, it was very bed driven. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would be that way in new areas still. And so like, don't, don't lose sight of the bed thing. Like for me, finding beds and, and understanding the bedding based on all the factors that we've discussed is very important and that it's a huge role in actually killing the deer. Um, but I'm at the point in a lot of these spots where like, I know where the beds are at. You know, I scout them every year or two years and I have an idea whether there's you know a new blowdown or a new clear cut like pretty much what's going to be going on as far as betting goes and I think a lot of people can say that about their areas so for me it's really a matter of figuring out where he's going to end up like what food source is he going to shift back onto and as soon as he does that I need to figure out my data as quickly as possible and so like that's my biggest that's my biggest uh thing I'm trying to figure out right now is is where is he going to be? Like I have, you know, this one specific deer, for example, I've got 15 to 18 different ridges that he could end up on that are all, you know, half mile long, three quarters of a mile long. They're big ridges. And so, okay, which one of those is, is going to be the ridge that he's, he's on to start because he shifts a lot. You know, every year we have a different, uh, acor acorn rotation. So like this year we have really good reds and some of these areas don't have great whites last year we had awesome whites and a lot of chestnut oaks, chestnut oaks and no reds um, we haven't had good reds in four years which is why i'm pretty excited for the reds because i have a pretty good idea of where i think he's going to end up um, so so now it's really a matter of like pre-staging some cameras right we're in the big woods i'd like to pre-stage some cameras uh running creeks trying to check for tracks like that's you probably saw my story the other day i'm just going yep. up creeks and like all right can I cut his track? If I can cut his track, it's going to give me a pretty good idea because the wind's starting to blow down some of the ripe acorns of where he might want to be this year. Um, and then I'll, I'll always keep a perimeter as well around that area just to make sure I don't lose sight of that deer. Like a mile, mile and a half perimeter, a lot of times I'll just, I'll keep tabs on it. Like if I see a new rub, I'll take a picture with my phone. And then, you know, if I walk through there a week from now and there's another rub, well, man, I didn't have that rub before. Or is that a new rub? And I look at my phone. No, it's the same rub I have from a week ago. Right. So I'll start just like trying to collect that data on where he's going to end up. Um, you'll start to see other deer shift around, uh, listening to the squirrels. It's about the time where you can just get up in the woods and you can listen. And you're going to hear where the, where the major acorns are going to be. Like the squirrels are pretty much on the acorns at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, they're not going to eat all of them. The deer are going to get a chance to get to them, especially if they're shifting in a couple of days and they don't rot. Um, so, so that's something that's going through my head. But the biggest thing is, is really trying to figure out like what food source is he going to end up on? Um, if it's this red oak flat, what data do I have based on this red oak flat being hot with him there or with another mature buck there 
uh, you know, I'll look at my Onyx at that point. Where's where's the beds at in this location? Pretty, I'll probably even have them in my head. And then how is he going to navigate to get to that flat? Uh, and what does that hunt look like, right? Like try to play it out in my head. Like how do I, how do I access in here based on the prevailing wind that I think that he'll bed in the specific bed for that specific food source? And, you know, I'll try to call my shot like that and take that shot. A lot of times I am wrong because he betted in something that didn't make as much sense maybe, or maybe mm-hmm. it made more sense to him because he had, you know, a better thermal pole or whatever it may be. Or a coyote um, bumped him or w- whatever happened. Yeah, it, exactly. And so, so, okay. So now I have the, I'm starting to formulate the kill plan, right? Well, for me, a lot of times that kill plan is only like a three to five day, uh, like window and then you have to come up with a brand new plan because that's what starts from what i've seen that's what starts the shift in the in the big timber a lot Mm -hmm. and they'll start bouncing from food source to food source whatever may cause that it it might dry up there might be uh some pressure from hunting you know like guys are starting to come in there and scout around or, or hang some sets or whatever it is and so like okay i have option one this is my plan right now, but I want to start keeping tabs on more options in case this one fails. So what's option two? What's option three? How am I going to monitor those options? So now I'm going to do the same thing I did with one in two and three, and maybe I'll catch that deer shifting early, or maybe I'll bump him the day I go to try to kill him, and then he bumps over to those, one of those other spots, and now I have a pretty good idea of what's happening over there. Um, while this is happening, like if I have weird, say I have a bad wind condition day, I'll, I'll once again go scout perimeters to see if there's new food sources popping up, see if I can find new signs. So I'm always, it's funny because I'm, I'm almost putting, I, I absolutely am actually, I'm putting more work in trying to eliminate or find the backup plan than I am actually finding the kill location a lot of times. Hmm. Like to me, the kill location is like, I, I have an idea of where I think that's going to happen, but how do I keep eliminating ground and how do I keep having backup plans? Right. And that's how I, that's how I stay on the deer throughout the year. Like last year, I mean, I lost him, you know, whether it was logging operations or pressure or whatever it was, I keep losing that deer and I keep relocating him all year. I think I relocated him like four or five times over the, and it was probably two and a half miles of ridges, mm-hmm. like as the crow flies. And then he has spur ridges he can bet off. So I had to keep bouncing and he'd go down the ridge and then he'd come back a mile. You know, and so like it's this constant chase back and forth trying to figure out the sign. And, and so that was, that was my process. And I felt like I kept re- relocating him pretty quick. Yeah. I was um, going to ask, like, I, what was the time frame in between, like, when you would lose him to find him again? So I think the longest one was probably about 10 days. Okay. And it was, it was down there pretty much every day trying to find him. Um, you know, a lot of observation sits, a lot of like, hey, this, the sign's hot. There's acorns on the ground, there's whites on the ground. There's some saplings ripped in half, and then I set up on it, and it's a different buck. Mm. Or, or I relocate him late October over a big scrape in a saddle, like coming over the top, his tendency, right? Like we mm-hmm. talked about, and I set up on it, and I end up passing a 154 <laughs> because it was, it was the wrong deer. Like it right. wasn't him. And then uh, so I just, I just kept doing that, and, and then eventually I get my shot, and I just shoot over top of his back. <laughs> just heartbreaker. What, date, what was the date on that? Man, I I don't know if it was, I want to say it was November 2nd or 3rd. Okay. And he was just, all he was doing is running the transition of an old clear cut. It's basically uh, two clear cuts meet and a hog's back from a, from a really deep drainage meets a saddle. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a four, you know, four thing hits a point and there's a scrape right there. X marks the spot. X marks the spot. And I was just... So what I, what I finally told myself, I chased that deer as far as I thought that he would go north. It took forever to get there. Um, and what I was doing is I would access from the south intentionally. That way I'm blowing my wind down all those ridges every day. So, okay, so if he's bedded out there, he's not going to be happy, right? And if I keep doing that, eventually he's, I want to make sure I keep that deer north because I feel like I have him pinched. And when I felt like I had him pinched, I just sat. I just would stay in it. I mean, it was the most miserable I don't know what it was, eight or nine days or whatever it was in a row of me climbing in that same stand from dark to dark and just sitting there. And I saw a lot of deer. I saw him twice out of that stand. Um, the first time, like probably 35 yards in the thicket and he never came out. He just came up and scent checked and went back. But I was like, oh, that's him. Like he's here. And then a couple of days later, 
Um, he popped up over the ridge. He's, he was chasing around a little doe a little bit. And he really doesn't participate in the rut unless they're like directly in his path. Like he's not cruising terrain features or, or out chasing around. Like he's actually a pretty, uh, he's a pretty solitary buck and he's definitely not the most aggressive buck in there. Like he's kind of submissive. Um, that big 10 point was that, that one. Oh man, he was like, he's all busted up. He's an absolute nightmare of a buck he came Mm -hmm. in um to like 12 yards when i passed him and i can hear him stomping over the saddle just do 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 and i'm like this is a you know i thought it was the the big eight coming i'm like this is a good deer and he's just he's intentionally like stomping his feet to make noise and i see him and he's all postured up and he like comes in all proud and i grab my bow i'm like I, i i still can't see antlers right i'm like what deer is this what deer is this so I get drawn back as he's coming in. I get to full draw and he snort wheezes at like, I don't know, maybe 25 or 30 feet from me. And just, I about fell out of the stand. <laughs> I mean, I've never heard a snort wheeze that loud. We'll have the video launching in a, in a couple of weeks, but it is just like unbelievable. And you can see the, you know, the steam coming out of his nose and everything. And he works in a little bit further and I'm like, oh, it's the wrong deer. And, uh, so I'm like, all right, well, I got to let down. Right. And so I go to let down and my thumb button hits my bino bivy and I launch an iron wheel with a luminoc into a tree, like 10 feet from the deer and just yeah. scare the living crap out of him. He runs off. I was just like, like in the video you hear like, Jake, that's not what you wanted to do. Like, right. what are you doing out here, guy? Dude, that- what I love is that you actually share that though. You know what I mean? Oh. Because dude, we've all done it and no one will admit to doing it. You know what I mean? It's like, that's the funny thing, dude. It's like, we all, everyone wants to act like they're, they're freaking perfect and they make no mistakes. Right. And it's like, no, we all make mistakes, dude. I love that. I did that when I was in Iowa, I drew back. Actually, I was just testing like, cause I was in a tree and I was like, let me make sure I'm good to draw here. And like, right. I got into a tree. I hadn't been in before drew back and just like, like off it went, you know what I mean? I was like, son of a, like, you know, it's like, but we all do it, man. We all make those mistakes. I love the fact that you mentioned that, dude. That's like that's like my favorite part. We're gonna make a clip out of that. That's gonna be like a so. That's gonna be like a, a reel. <laughs> oh, dude, when you see the video, like you, the luminox just flying and just smokes that tree right right next to him, and I was just like, oh, well, first off, thank God that I missed him, right? Like, right. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to. If it would have been, it would have been unbelievable if it would have been further right. Like, like right. what just happened? <laughs> but um. But yeah, man, I mean, that's part of it. Right. And yeah, like, dude. you know, I, maybe I used to have a little bit more pride, but now it's, it's, a, it's a fun thing for me. And I, yeah, yeah. I, I enjoy dude, that. If we can't laugh at ourselves, dude, then I don't know what we're doing, you know? <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, man. So, so I did end up chasing that deer, uh, the whole year. And I mean, once again, I can say the same story I told you last year, I learned a ton about him, right? Right. Like, all the way up until the end of season, I learned a ton about him, um, couldn't find his sheds. We looked every, we found every other buck sheds, but his sheds. I mean, <laughs> it was unbelievable. You know, they're the biggest ones out there. So you think you'd be able to find them, but, um, right. but yeah, so, so we'll see what happens, man. I, uh, I, I hope I can chase him down, right. but, but we'll see. Do you feel like you have a good shot for early season or do you feel like the, do you feel like it's going to be more of like a november type of thing? Like similar, like to the encounter that you had, you know, last year when you caught up to him? So that's, uh, last year was the most confident I've, I think I've ever been on a deer going into early season. Hmm. I mean, this deer was, was dialed. Like I could, I could catch him crossing a ridge every single day, morning and afternoon. And no doubt in my mind, I'm like very easy access for me. Not easy. It was tricky, but like there was no way he was going to detect me. It was undetectable access. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way that he was crossing the ridge, he just left himself totally exposed and then the I got the picture of that skitter with the scrape in the bucket, right? And they logged the whole the whole hillside. So there's there's some new variables out mm-hmm. there and um you know, A is he is he still around, right? Like right. you know, B what where's he gonna end up in this two or three miles of ridges? Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of variables there, but if I can get him where I think I'm gonna get him, I think I have a pretty good shot. I just have to go down there and, and validate that he's doing what I hope he's doing. Um, so that's, that's the big goal. If, if I can catch him on that Ridge, I think that I can catch him on a very similar pattern to last year, early season. He's, he's so confident early season. It's frustrating. Yeah. You know, he like, he's a daylight buck. Um, 
not a whole lot of care in the world. And then as soon as he senses pressure, he's gone. So it's like the the old thing we've talked about before where you want to be the first person to induce pressure on that deer, right? Like I need to be the first guy in there to get set up and try to kill him. And I think if he's in the right spot, I can do that. So, right. so we'll see, man. Um, you know, it, it's been a great chase up to this point, whether it ends this year or not, I've, I've, I've loved chasing that deer. So it's taught me a lot about deer hunting. It's, uh, I probably sound like I know less than I used to, but it's taught me that there's more variables. <laughs> that you see, you know? Well, dude, I think the thing is, man, is as we get older and we learn more, I think that's a natural progression is that we realize that we know less than we think we do. You yeah. know what I mean? And like, and to me, that's like in every facet of life, that is like a sign of, of true understanding <laughs> that you actually do know, you know, it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's like, I know what I don't know, which might be important to what I do know, you know? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, man. So what else? Uh, so you're chasing him in Ohio. What else you have going on for this season? You have any other, other plans or you're just kind of playing it by year? Uh, playing it by year, just, just for the family, you yeah. know, uh, it's going to be a couple of years where I'm not traveling around a whole lot and I'm, I'm trying to be efficient. Um, the one thing I can do, my, my brother owns a house in New York where I used to yeah, live. Yeah, when I, so. you and I were texting, you said you were up there scouting. Yep. So yeah. we, I mean, there's, there's some great bucks up there too. And we've, we have the same approach up there. Mm -hmm. It's just bigger floor to ceiling in the Allegheny mountains, basically. Right. Um, so we'll be up there and then I can take the family up there too. Yep. And we, you know, we, uh, make a, make a weekend out of it and I get to hunt a couple yeah. nights or something. So, so do a little bit of that, but it's, it's really going to be the Ohio chase for me this year. And, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm excited for it, man. Yeah, dude. I'm, I'm excited to see, I'm excited to see your success, my friend. I'm looking forward to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. With a gripping grin on this deer. Uh, I'm looking forward to watching the video when it drops, like the one that you that, that you'll put out. I always watch, uh, always check your stuff out, man. I always enjoy watching it. It's always good content. It's always, honest and authentic and it's just it's why you're one of my favorite people to chat with um but uh, i've kept you here long enough away from the away from the wife and the kids so before i let you get going let people know where they can find out more about what you got going on they can watch the video and uh, anything you have going on on in the digital space if you will yeah of course so um so the instagram is just jake bush and then you can add me on facebook at jake bush uh, i have a youtube channel called it, it's actually just jake bush it used to be legends of the hunt but it's just jake bush now and then um all the hunts from last year will be airing over on the latitude outdoors youtube so um they should be dropping here in the next you know couple weeks month ish something like that but they're going to be awesome it showcases a lot of highs and lows from last year it's <laughs> it was a it was a lot of hunting um some you know not so great decisions on my part uh, a couple bad shots, but overall, we all worked our butts off and ended up getting on some good deer. So I think it'll be a, a great season for that show, too. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, dude. Good luck this year. We'll be texting and staying in touch with each other and then uh, looking forward to seeing that grip and grin. Yeah, thanks again, Clint. I uh, I always enjoy being on here. I appreciate it. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there too. And before I shut this thing down, we need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Osseo Gear, Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Genesee Beer. And until next time, we'll see y'all.